was down there working. So. Hey, Manufacturing World, welcome to a special edition of Shop Matters. Uh, for the last little while, we do podcasts in the studio. Today, we're going to do something completely unique and different. We're going live on Instagram as we talk about all things manufacturing related. One of the most important functions of any manufacturing job, or any manufacturer, I should say, are the people. You can have great ideas, you can have a great machine, you can have a great business model, but if you don't have great people to facilitate that, you're not gonna get very far. So today, we're gonna spend a little bit of time and talk to a lot of the engineers that we've got at Akuma to give you a little example of what life is like in the life of our application engineers, our product engineers, and even our service technicians. We're also gonna spend a few minutes and we're gonna show you a little bit of technology that we've got. We're gonna show you a multifunction machine. We're gonna show you modern automation as well as where the future is going with 3D printing uh, from a metal aspect. So let's go ahead and get started. First off, let me introduce you to one of our application engineers, Will. Will, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm an application engineer here at Tacoma America. I've been here for almost two years. All right. So I've mentioned application engineer a couple of times already. Explain what an application engineer is. Coming up through school, I always heard about mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, even civil engineering. Until I got into the machine tool industry, I didn't know what an application engineer was. Tell us a little bit about what an application engineer is and what a typical day for you looks like. Application engineer here at Akuma. Uh, it's our job to be experts on the machines that we sell. Uh, we help support our customers with any to learn the features and functions of the machines and help them produce the parts they need to, to keep their customers happy. All right. So what do you like best about the role that you do? Um, a lot of the new technology. We're always playing with the latest and greatest machines here. Uh, we get to make some cool parts. We get to lock, work with lots of cool partners on cool innovative projects. All right. So. Talk us through a little bit of some of the parts that you've done, some innovative stuff that you've worked on since you've been with Okuma. Well, this part here, um, this feature on the top here was something one of our partners came up with. They had a customer of theirs. Um, they used to do this. It took them two processes on two different machines to make this part, and it took them 10 minutes to cut these little teeth on here. Um, our partner came up with a new tool design that we tested on our machines here and proved out, cut that cycle time from 10 minutes down to 30 seconds, and we did it all in one setup. Fantastic. So it gives you an opportunity to really challenge yourself and test the limits of what's known in manufacturing. That's right. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. No problem. So we're going to transition from some of the work that we do at Okuma from an application engineer standpoint to one of our partner companies. So I guess from a manufacturing standpoint, let me explain to the, the kids and uh, parents watching. Okuma, we build CNC machine tools. CNC is a computer numerically controlled machine. So it requires a computer program to actually run the tool path to cut material. So while we build the machine tool, we don't cut anything without other partner companies' involvement. So right now we're going to talk to one of our CAD CAM companies and he's going to give us a little bit of an overview on what life is like as a CAD CAM programmer and how he got into the industry. Yeah. Welcome, Christian. Hey, how you doing, Wade? I'm doing well. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yeah, what you so, do. Yeah, uh, so my name is Christian Jewell. I work for Spree, which is a CAD CAM company. And if you don't know what CAM is, that's computed aided manufacturing. And what's really great about that is we'll go around here and you're going to see all these crazy cool parts and also these really nice machines. And these machines are being programmed by a CAM system, which is what we do. And we're actually taking what we call almost a video game and translating that into code, language that the machine can read, and that's gonna control how that machine's moving around and making these cool parts like you see right here, this car, or those previous parts that were made by Esprit shown in the previous shot with Will. So I'm gonna date myself a little bit and talk about my age. So when I first got started programming CNC machine tools, it was on the old tape readers. Yeah. So we would punch tape and try to read the tape. Um, but to make five axis motion, I started programming machines before cam systems were really yeah. popular on the scene. So we did a lot of very complex math routines. Actually, my resume, when I applied for work at Okuma, I turned in a resume and I turned in a sample program that was a nine page long math routine. So that's how I programmed CNC back in the days. Today, you do it more through a model, through a, a computer-aided graphic. Yeah, exactly. So okay. instead of going through all those math things, that's all being taken care of by us behind the scenes. You don't really have to worry about that. So all you have to do is just get your model, say what you want to make, mm -hmm. get whatever you're going to start from, and you just tell it, hey, I want to do this, this, and this, and then we translate that for you, and it takes it right to the machine, and you're going to get a nice part. 
And what's great about us three is we have all that eliminated with the hard work in the background. You just hit the post button, we translate that logic for you, and you're ready to go with the machine, and you're gonna get nice, moving machine motion, and you're gonna make a really cool part. All right, tell us a little bit about your education. How did you get into the, the CAD CAM programming world? Yeah, yeah, so I went to the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and I got my mechanical engineering degree there. Okay. And when I went out from, I was looking for jobs, all these engineering jobs, and what I was really attracted to about the manufacturing industry is you get to actually talk to people. You get to go visit customers, you got to work on really unique things, and some things I can't even say I've worked on, but you yeah. get to work on some really cool stuff. Right. And what I'm working on is pretty much just a video game. I just translate everything I want to do on the computer to what's going to happen on the machine, and it's super simple. Now you just do a little bit of math every once in a while, but you're going to learn that in school, and that's easy. Okay. So you made a, a pretty interesting point in my mind is your education is actually as a mechanical engineer where you're working Correct, purely yeah. basically in software. Yeah, exactly. But you have to know the mechanical side of it because when you're removing material, you have to know how to hold the part, how do, how do your tool paths work, what kind of deflection rates do you get into, and then even uh, how to troubleshoot when you're making a cut and you're experiencing chatter and things like that. Yeah. You have to have that mechanical background to really understand the mechatronics of the machine yeah, exactly. to troubleshoot that, that. That mechanical background is really critical for when you're doing parts like this and you're using these tools on these nice machines, you want to make sure that you're doing it the right way. You want it to sound really smooth, nice, and you want to see a nice smooth finish on your part as well. Right. All that information is going to be taken care of by our software, but you want to know how do I want to approach those and the software is going to help you get that solution really quickly. All right. So we're gonna transition now over to and actually look at one of the machine tools. So Christian's gonna make his way over to Craig. They're gonna swap microphones. As we're doing that, I'll give the audience here, and again, this, this episode is really targeted towards kids looking to get into manufacturing. So this is a part that's been machined. So as I talk about the machining process, this part has a lot of different processes in it. There's turning, where we're actually spinning the part and removing material using a cutting tool. So we're turning the part and cutting. And then there's also milling, where the part is stationary and the tool is rotating and we do milling operations or drilling operations. So in a traditional way of manufacturing a component like this, I would take a blank piece of stock, I would chuck one end of it, and I would turn the face, OD, any kind of geometry along the face, I would transfer that, either rotate it or transfer it to another machine to do the opposite end, what we would call the OP20. So you'd have OP10, Operation 20. We would do that machining. Then from there, we would set it up on a mill to do any kind of mill work. If it's straight like this is, it would go into a mill straight. But if you look at this port, that's on an angle. I don't know if you can see that on an Instagram feed. So to do that on a traditional machine, you either have to fixture that part at an angle or you have to tilt the head of the machine to be able to match that angle. Modern manufacturing, however, we combine all those type of operations into a machine that we call a multifunction machine. So the machine that I'm gonna walk up to next is what we call our multis, and that's a play on words. The multis, the mole part, is the multifunction aspect of this machine. So let me introduce you to Craig Mainzinger. Craig, Hi, introduce yourself, tell us your job, what you do, right. and then let's give an overview of the machine. Well, as Wade said, I'm Craig Mainzinger. I'm an applications engineer here. I actually moved from Michigan, to, specifically down to Charlotte, to come work at Akuma, and uh, we'll take you through the machine. So, um, lathes and mills, as Wade was saying, those are two different kinds. They've been around for a long time, since the 1800s, but this is, you know, in the last couple of decades, been the latest technology. So. You have a lathe over here, which is where the part can spin. Then you have a lathe over here. Again, the part can spin. This up here can either hold a stationary tool or hold a spinning tool and then rotate to any angle. So all those features can be made now in one operation instead of what might have taken as many as five operations in the past. So when we get into multifunction machines like this, there's a lot of processing taking place in one machine takes a lot of brain power to think your way through the cutting process and how you want to approach that. Going back to the CAD CAM system, that makes the programming aspect of a machine like this a whole lot easier. Yeah, people are a lot, uh, you know, the human mind's a lot better at working with pictures and models and things like that as opposed to what's on the machine is numbers and letters. Right. So the CAD CAM system kind of ties all that together for you and you know that you want to make a hole 
you don't care if that hole's on an angle, you, you do the same thing for that hole, whether it's on an angle, coming in from the front of the part, the side of the part, or what have you. Okay, so I hate to talk about this aspect of machining, but there is a very real aspect when you get into complicated machines where there's a lot of different axes of collisions. So no different than if you're a 16 year old young student driver getting behind the wheel and you have a fender bender, that happens in machine tools as well. Yeah. Um, Not just uh, if you're new though, I mean, you, yeah. can be, you can be in it for 15, 20 years and still crash Absolutely, machine, so. so if you're human, human things are gonna happen. Yeah. So one of the things that we do to try to fail safe this machine is we have a software that's called collision avoidance software where we actually incorporate a model of the machine itself and in real time, the computer is looking ahead to everything that's going on in the machine environment and it won't let the spindle come into contact with a chuck, for an example. Yeah. Show us a little bit on the screen what that looks like. So running in the background of this machine, it's not doing anything right now because the machine's not doing anything right now, but there is a virtual version, which is a machine modeled up. You can also add parts and tooling as needed to this model and it, your part will actually be cut by your tool. So if you so if you look at that part, that is that part right here in the main spindle of the chuck. Yep. So you can actually have this as a cylinder and then your tools will cut this part. But if you were to take that, which is a tool holder, and try to even manually feed it into this part, it would stop you about a quarter inch away and tell you you're about to crash into that if you keep going. You Very to, good. Do you have to be really good in math to be an engineer? Yes. I would say yes. So it's not 100% required, but if you're not comfortable with math and science, I mean, that's what machining is. That's, there's heat and pressures, and all this can be done with math formulas and figured out. Luckily, most of that is given to you, that information, but the understanding of it, that's what you need. So I'll be very humble and uh, share my schooling experience. I was the smart aleck kid in the back of the math classroom telling my math teacher, you're never going to use that stuff in the real world. <laughs> Nobody needs trig. Yeah. And where math came alive for me, going back to this part, is when I had to put an angle on a part. I got my first job as a machinist, I'm cranking handles on a bridge port, I had a part that I had to put an angle on, and as I sat there and tried to figure out how to get this angle, and I start making little triangles, all of a sudden everything that the math teacher told me really came to life in real life for me. Then I understood trigonometry and, and other uh, type of equations. I've done a lot of variable programming and things that are massive math equations that in school I didn't understand it but in real life when I started working with it it all made sense to me. Yeah. So the reason I want to bring up the collision avoidance software is technology is moving at a very fast pace. Um, I'm a huge fan of education. I'm, I'm going to school right now currently as we speak. You can't stop the education process. A lot of people, they'll, they'll get educated to a certain level, get a two-year degree, a four-year degree, master's, a doctorate degree. I don't care what level you get to, you can't stop at that level because technology and the world will pass you by at that point. Education and knowledge has a shelf life. You have to stay up with where the industry is going and where technology is going. Automation is a key component to that. I spent years teaching robots, um, taking a Fanuc robot or a, a Moto Man Yaskawa robot, and we would have teach pendants, and we would teach it just like I'm moving my arm. We would teach it all the points to get in and out of the machine tool. This machine has what we call an armroid robot. This is an Akuma built robot that's integral to the machine itself. And the most amazing feature of that is it is a somewhat self teaching robot. We tell it where the pickup points are, and we'll move, uh, we'll kind of move this into place and go ahead and get started yeah. running this. But we tell the robot where to pick the parts up and where the location is in the chuck that we want it to load to. But getting in and out of the machine itself, it utilizes ladder logic, control logic on the robot, looking at, go ahead, yeah. looking at the actual collision avoidance software and it figures out its own path to get in and out of that machine tool. So one of the things, sorry Craig, yep. one of the things that you'll see, we have a what we call a stocker table. This is where we stock all the parts. You can see some of the switches, these little red dots. Those are switches looking at where that part is and it will advance the part up so the robot will come in and grab the component.
and the only operator intervention is teaching the robot where that point is on that table and where the point is inside the spindle. So All the, of those moves right there were automatically programmed based on the models that we were looking at earlier. That's a good point. So all this motion from that point on, that robot taught itself. Another key component for operations like this when we get into automation are other value added features that you can do with it. So this robot is actually capable of having a work support to be able to follow apart to give better damping during the cut, as well as be able to have a coolant wand to be able to flush out a machine for chips and things of that nature to really help you control the manufacturing process. And what's going on in the machine right now is passing it over from how there's basically two lathes inside this machine. It's passing it from one side to the other. And the machine can sense when it's actually touching that part. So for different part lengths, it will automatically compensate and it'll be in the same spot every time on this other side. All right, so Craig, why don't you go ahead and transfer to Anthony. So this is a really good look of where technology is going, where automation is going. Um, automation is a ever evolving process in the manufacturing world. Manufacturers today have to compete on a global level. So the IP that you have in your manufacturing process will really dictate how successful you will be in competing from a global standpoint. So the smarter we get with technology, the more we utilize technology and push those boundaries, the better we're going to be from a, from a productivity standpoint and a competitive standpoint in the market. All right, so let's make our way over to Anthony. We're going to talk a little bit about the Apprentice program. Anthony, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get involved in Okuma and the manufacturing world? Hey everyone, so my name is Anthony Mediate. I'm an Applications Engineer Apprentice here at Akuma, and I've worked here for a little bit over a year. Uh, I got into manufacturing straight out of high school. My buddy was working in his shop and he said, hey, I run this machine, you know, I hit the button, it cut something out of metal, and then I throw another one, and I thought that sounded pretty cool. So I worked in machine shops for a couple years, and then uh, I heard about the apprenticeship through Akuma, through my buddy, we do a service apprenticeship here at Akuma as well and he actually went through that. And then, so he told me that they were opening an apprentice one and I went on to Kuma's website under careers, applied for it and got accepted. All right. So tell us a little bit about the apprentice program. What did you do? How did that work for you? So the apprenticeship, it started out with six months of training, uh, both here at Akuma and with our partners. So um, Sandvik tooling to cut the parts and all that. We went out to Illinois and actually had some training up there. We worked with our CAM partners like Esprit and uh, Master Cam and had some training with them, work holding with S&W, all kinds of things like that. And very important is he is a well-dressed guy. That's a great shirt that you got on, by the way. Uh, yeah, so. we called each other this morning. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your final project that you did. So with the apprenticeship program, you go through a, a training period where you learn a lot of different aspects of the manufacturing environment. And then we actually assign a, a project to you to do you machine that, you program it, and then you also present it back to everybody as a almost a, a judging or a scoring application, correct? Correct, so uh, they assigned us a machine and then limited, give us some uh, specifications for the part we had to make and all that, but they let us choose the part. And we designed it from start to finish with everything we've learned in the apprenticeship. Okay. And then uh, I actually made a triple tree for a motorcycle. It's kind of scaled down a little bit, but then we gave a presentation and we're judged on certain criteria. And if you pass, then you made it through. All right, so tell us what a triple tree is. I mentioned, you mentioned a motorcycle, but for anybody yeah. that's not familiar with a triple tree, what does that do on the motorcycle itself? So a triple tree is what connects the forks that hold the wheel on to the handlebars and all the controls and like that so you can steer. So it's a pretty important. So one of the things that I found, find most amazing about manufacturing, especially the, the machine tool world, is we touch 
everything that you come in contact with in society. So you can see the wheel here behind us, triple tree motorcycle parts, race components, everything all the way down to your cell phone. And the case that your cell phone is in took a mold for this to be able to be produced. All that starts its life on a machine tool. If, uh, what's the saying? If God didn't create it, a machine tool did, I believe. And I think yeah. that's very true. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So I tell you what, why don't you go ahead and transfer your mic to Casey. Um, we're going to bring in a different aspect of careers uh, within the machine tool world. We talked a lot about the metal cutting process, application engineering, programming. We're going to bring in one of our software uh, gurus, if you will, the guy that's our go-to guy. Casey, come on in. Oh, you want me to come over there? All right, they're making me walk now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make you walk over here. So, so Casey, you. introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your job, what your role is. So uh, Casey Grusor, uh, principal engineer in the product engineering group, uh, mostly for software and factory automation products. Uh, my background is I started out at a two-year school going to the school for electronics engineering technology. And that's what I was doing when I came to Okuma for about four years until 2004, I was brought into the software service slash engineering group because we were introducing this control that you were talking about a little while ago, the PC-based control. And that was a huge opportunity for me and really set up everything that I've done since. Um, it, aside from supporting the hardware of the control itself, it eventually forced me to support software developers. Okay. And the, the, the act of doing that kind of forced me to learn how to write software, which became my next job, which was software engineer here, writing custom applications to run on this on okay. control. Tell us a little bit about a custom application. What does that look like on a machine tool itself? Well, I mean, it's a Windows computer. We, we go all the way back to Windows 2000, XP 7, and Windows 10. So 10 is the current platform. So if you can write an application in C Sharp or Java or VB.net, uh, HTML5, you know, the, the, the stack for that, uh, you can write an application that will run on this control. And usually the goal is to integrate information here with an outside source or vice versa. Um, handling the transfer of program information to the control or something like that. Uh, custom interfaces. Um, I'm trying to trying to think of all the different things we've done, but it's it, it, it's really a wide variety, and mostly you never know what the next opportunity is going to be because somebody out there's got an idea and they come to us, and then it's our job to figure out how to make it work. Okay, I'm going to grab this part behind you. Yeah, I, I keep kind of going back to this part just because it's an easy one to to reference. Something that's very important for all the engineers that work for a machine tool company is we have to be flexible and we have to be able to adapt quickly to customers' needs. You could have two customers making this exact same part, but they're going to machine it completely different. And again, that goes back to the IP, or sorry, the intellectual property of your manufacturing process and how you can be more competitive. So what a guy like Casey does We'll come up with a, a new process, and maybe we need to tie in a third-party piece of equipment to it. We need to have that piece of equipment communicate to our control or be able to do certain routines. He would actually develop custom software to address a customer's specific requirements. That's right. So, again, a lot of it has to do with information into and out of the control, but mm -hmm. then working in the product engineering group, you also work, I also work closely with our electrical engineering group and the mechanical engineers. So there's other projects that, that involve actual physical movement of the machine and uh, interfaces to exter external devices. This, this is new. You know, this was developed entirely by Okuma, but you know, we have integrated with other robot systems, of course. Um, Absolutely. And recently I did a, a project where we integrated with a, a, a hardness tester. So in process, they're testing the, the physical hardness of the part that they're machining. Yeah. Of the material, the yep. metal that they're cutting? Yeah, which okay. had never been done before, in not in process. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. So let's go ahead and transfer to Charlie. I want to talk a little bit now about, so we've talked so far leading up to basically cutting apart. Uh, what an application engineer is, what a programmer is, what guys like Casey 
do from a custom software aspect, but all these machines have a lot of moving components to them. I talked a little bit about every once in a while there's accidents that happen on these machines. We have to have people that are skilled and trained to be able to repair them and keep them running in the field. So Charlie, I'm going to bring you up. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you do for Akuma? Hey, how's it going? I'm Charlie Cagle. I'm the field service manager here at Akuma. I, uh, I have a team of about 17 guys that go around the, probably the Western Hemisphere, I'd say. Mm -hmm. We do uh, North America, a little bit of South America. Uh, we install and repair Akuma CNC machine tools. Okay. So you've got a, a group of service technicians. Yes, sir. So they are, think about almost like a mechanic for yep. a machine tool. Instead of working on a, on a vehicle, they're working on machine tools. What do you look for when you're hiring somebody? What kind of education? What kind of experience um, from an experience standpoint? And then let's touch a little bit on the apprentice program. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. So there's two, two types of guys we hire. There'd be an experienced guy that we'd hire that we would expect to come in off the street and produce right away. So that guy, we would look for experience working on machine tools, right? Uh, we love guys that come from an OEM, mm -hmm. um, guys that have done field service on Japanese built machine tools, that's a plus. So that's, that's group one, that's the guys that have experience we expect to come and hit the ground running. And then we have another group, what we would call the apprentice hires. Mm -hmm. Those guys, um, we typically get no CNC experience with those guys. So what we expect from those guys is good attitude, um, usually mechanical aptitude. Um, yeah, those are probably the, the two biggest things. We hire those guys based on potential. You know, the experience isn't there. So you look at character, you look at potential, and you look at mechanical or electrical aptitude, and you try to envision where they'll be in three or four years because it's it's quite an investment to hire one of those guys and put the years of training in before you get the return on investment. Right. I think that's such a critical component is the character aspect of it. Yep. Um, you can teach about any skill that you need to. You can't teach ethics, work ethics, character, things of that nature. So 100%. we look for people that's got a servant heart. Uh, yep. That's a big, big thing that we talk about here at Okuma. And if you don't have certain skill sets, a lot of times we can prop that up. We can yep. give you the training and the knowledge you need but we need that character to, to come from in here yep. to be able to do that type of job and role. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into <laughs> so, the manufacturing world or the so, machine tool so world? Maybe not a traditional path. Um, after high school, I did the community college thing. Uh, I never really found anything I was passionate about, so I did that for a few years. Around that time, I was really obsessed with motorcycles. I decided I want to be a Harley Davidson mechanic, right? So I moved to Florida. I got a certification, a factory certification from a school to work on Harleys. I came back to this area, I did that for a few years. I then found an opportunity to go into the machine tool business. A local distributor in this area had an, an opening for sort of an apprentice uh, type position to be a field service guy. So I worked with them for 10 years. The first CNC machine I saw was the first day that I showed up to work there. So I knew literally nothing about CNC machines. Okay. So I worked there for 10 years. I learned a ton working for those guys. and. Uh, that gave me the opportunity to come over to Akuma. Mm -hmm. I uh, came to Akuma, I worked in the support center for three years, and then two years ago, I was moved over to the field service manager at Akuma. Okay, excellent. So I think the one key aspect, as we talk about apprenticeships and the apprenticeship program, is a mentoring uh, aspect of it. So you need that positive habit transfer of somebody who's been in this industry for a while that can help pull you along, teach you skills, and give you some of the knowledge uh, that comes from a life on the road. Yeah. What's a typical day look like for a field service technician? Well, that's that's kind of the beauty of this job is there's not a typical day in this Excellent. job. That's what that's you don't what draws, get to have boredom. Yeah, you don't get boredom. <laughs> that's what draws a lot of people to this career. It's what keeps them here. So, um, a guy may fly out on Monday morning. He may go to a to a place that manufactures guns. Right. He may right. install a machine there or fix a machine there. Um, he flies back Friday afternoon. The next Monday morning, he's on a plane headed to a customer that makes um, automotive wheels, right? Mm -hmm. He's there for a week, he fixes their machine. The next week, he may go to a place that makes um, airplane parts. You see something different every week. Every shop you go in, it's different. Always so, challenging yourself, always learning new always things. Always change, you never, you never learn it all. Yep. You never learn it all. All right, Charlie, thank you for your time. We're gonna make our way into the laser lab. We're gonna spend the next 
10 minutes or so, kind of wrap it up and look at another piece of technology. So if you'll walk with me a little bit, we're gonna walk into the laser lab. And one of the things you'll notice, hopefully our uh, Wi-Fi feed doesn't hiccup on us, but all the doors and windows are blacked off. So you can't see into the lab itself. That's because this is an ITAR compliant room. So we do um, government type components, things that can't be seen uh, to the general public foreign uh, entities, things of that nature. So when we get those ITAR parts, we put them in this lab, the door's keyed, all the windows are blacked off, so nobody can see the type of work that goes on in here. For today, we're strictly doing, as Paula's phone is ringing on us, <laughs> we're strictly doing a demo part for you guys, so walk on in with us. And we're gonna transfer the mic back over to Craig. Craig's gonna join us one more time. As you probably uh, figured out, Craig is our main go-to guru for our multifunction style machines. You don't get any more multitasking than this machine here. This is our Multis U4000 Laser EX. So this machine is capable of turning, which is lathe work, milling, doing five axis milling work. It'll also do grinding, it can do laser heat treating if your parts have enough uh, carbon content, or you can do additive manufacturing. So one of the things that we're gonna look at inside this doghouse right here, this door opens up and there is a laser nozzle that comes out where we run a laser beam through the center of it that melts a weld pool on the bottom of a part, and then we flow powder around that nozzle to create 3D geometries. So walk us through a little bit, Craig. I'll stop doing some talking for a minute. Walk yeah. us through kind of what we're seeing the sequence here. So this is a prep blank, so basically a slug of steel here. We chuck it up in this area. So this is where the lathe work holding would hold the part. We actually rotate it and cut this surface and this surface. Then we come in with milling tools, cut these two flats on here, then come in with the laser and uh, melts powder basically spraying through the air and it builds up layer by layer almost like a welding process and builds those cylinders out of nothing and we came back in with a milling tool again and machined those cylinders off so similar to what you might see in a in a typical high school lab or something like that with a 3d printer uh, yeah. where they're printing the plastic, plastic parts yeah. we do something very similar only we use different types of material so you want to go ahead and yeah, start the machine running? Start it up, yeah. While you do that, Paula, walk with me. I'm going to show you a couple of other sample parts real quick. This is to give you a little bit of an idea of what you can do with material like that. So this is a block that one of our engineers, Paul Kingsley, put together. And I know it's going to be hard to see on the camera, but there's actually three different types of material. And the only material that is magnetic is the center material. So if I take this magnet off and move it and try to put it on the bottom, it always goes back to the one material that's magnetic. So you can do dissimilar types of materials all together through this laser process. This would be another example where we're using a, a stainless steel base, but then when we're doing a, an aluminum bronze type material on top of it. So you can see the penetration of the bronze material onto a different type of material base. We can start with a blank piece of steel and then 3D print in metal a part that eventually will get machined down to something like this. So the part gets machined down and then we part it off and cut the component off. Another aspect is actually doing heat treating. So you can have a softer material and then you could clad harder material like stellite or haspaloy, something like that, over the top of it. So you start with a less expensive base, you heat, uh, put laser clad harder material over the top, then machine that back down to have a harder wear surface. Or you could do die repair. So this is an example where a die was made, has certain components, and over time, if that gets damaged, we can machine it off weld laser clad new material onto it and then machine it back down to have a repair component. This happens a lot in the aerospace market. So we're gonna walk back over and actually watch this machine run a little bit. Yeah, so what I have done is gotten the machine 
ready at a point in the program where it's gonna grab the laser head out of that doghouse Wade was talking about. So we're at a point right now in this part where we got angles on the part, but no bosses printed on it. So there's a series of steps the machine has to go through to get ready, make sure there's clearances and everything is safe to move. That's the laser head coming out and coming down now. the head tilting so with this being a five axis mill and a lathe combined you can also do five axis laser tool paths right now it's waiting on powder so there is some time there's a maybe 20 feet of line that the powder has to come through so the laser has to wait for it to be coming out of the nozzle So right now the powder is going from the powder feeder itself down into the machine system. Yep. There's right a countdown timer that we set up and then the laser comes on and the powder starts flowing. So here it's adding material one round at a time basically and then it's going to 3D print that boss or that component that you're working on. We have a camera. Speak up louder and then everyone's going to be out here to share. How and long you can actually, this is looking down the barrel, if you will, of the laser. So you're looking outside of the lens and seeing the laser melt uh, a pool in the metal and you see the little lighter colored dots. Those are particles of powder actually getting melted on their way to or from that weld bead, essentially. So bit by bit, this will build up and you can just keep going and going. Then you can always come in and machine features. After that, you can go back in again and build off those machine features. All right, so from here, let's go ahead and walk back out. Natalie told us that uh, a question came in about how long people have worked for the company. So we'll walk back out in the main area and yeah, come with us, Craig. Paul. Somebody asked, how long have we been working for the company? So we'll go kind of around a circle here. So the question came in, how long have we worked for the company? Um, anybody that joined us before or after the intro, my name is Wade Anderson. I'm a product specialist manager with Akuma and I host our uh, podcast that we do, Shop Matters. I've been with Akuma 15 years. I worked for another OEM machine tool builder for 11 years prior to that. And before that, I spent about three years in uh, just a, a manufacturing environment. I got started actually, if there's anybody online or watching this from Missouri, at a manufacturing company called Duke Manufacturing in Sedalia, Missouri, programming a Salvanini shear press and brake system. So Craig, tell us how long have you been? I've been here since June of 2019, so not very long, but I was an applications engineer five years prior to that up in Michigan, and I got started, I believe it was the summer before, the summer after my freshman year of high school, uh, just cutting uh, chunks of steel, belt sanding them, doing very simple tasks. I mean, I sweep floors and just learned more and more and more until I eventually got up to here, so. Charlie? Charlie Cagle, Field Service Manager. I've been at Akuma five years and I've been in this industry 15 years. I'm Paul Kingsley. I'm Senior Applications Engineer here at Akuma. I've been here for about seven years now. Um, been in manufacturing for about 35, so I've, I've spent a lot of time in this. I'll be talking with you about the laser again here in just a little bit when we go back into there. So, basic your sore. 
I've been at Okuma since November of 1999, so day 21 years next month. Wow. Uh, I've been in manufacturing since I've been in manufacturing since the beginning of my career, and I've had four different jobs here at Okuma, so there's been no shortage of opportunities here. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up at this point. So we kind of hit our 40 minute mark. Um, any other questions, Paula, if anything comes in? Otherwise, uh, feel free to reach out to us and you can reach us at www.akuma.com and the podcast is www.akuma.com forward slash shop matters. We'll talk to you soon.